this year there have been nearly 500, there may actually have been more than 500 at this point, anti-LGBT bills introduced into state legislatures around this country. The lion's share focused on trans life, bills that would limit access to gender affirmative care, particularly focusing on trans youth, right? In the face of it, right, it just seemed, and it's not just now, it seemed for a while, that basically there, there are two ways to think about transness. Those who wish to uh, oppose the proffering of care to trans youth, who actually would seek to delegitimate transness altogether, focus on transness as a kind of, it's warped. It's not real, for one thing. And if someone comes to believe they're trans, something must have happened to them. The wrong influences, something bad happened. The wrong internet site, something bad happened. The wrong kind of touching, something bad happened, right? That trauma got in. They were warped. They're warped that way. As against this way of thinking transness that invalidates it, that pathologizes it, that treats it as something that's gone awry from the normal course of cisness to which the person can restored, be restored if you address the trauma, it's seen as if the only thing to counter is some sort of, if it's not born that way, it's some sort of core gender identity, um, whether in some sort of like intense psychological depth, which is equivalent to biologization, but something that is immutable, right? And that's the blackmail, right? And to defend trans life, we have to make these claims around or orbiting around core gender identity. And we're taking, we're making some different moves in this book because we actually, maybe counterintuitively, um, we think that trauma may indeed have something to do with the development of transness. Trauma has something to do with the acquisition of any gender. We're, this is all gender, we argue, may arise out of a relationship to trauma. In many ways, psychoanalysis gives us the resource with which to think about how trauma can do more than just disrupt us or throw us off course. Trauma can also be become something through the subject's development that turns out to be a resource, gets folded into the self and becomes a part of the self in a way that is not necessarily a departure from what the subject should have been, but rather creates possibilities for new sorts of becomings. If we don't start with a premise, as we don't in this volume, that there's something true about one's own kind of like subjectivity when it comes to their gayness or their queerness or their straightness or their cisness, but that we all become, then room opens up to think more complexly about the ways in which trauma can become an animating, a motor, an animating energy for uh, certain kinds of becomings. Uh, and we believe that that's true when it comes to normative gender. Uh, normative gender is itself a system of violence. Um, and many people come to inhabit their normative gender in ways that feel entirely congruent with their the sense of themselves, even as um, normative gender is also conditioned on uh, patriarchy and on misogyny, right? So there's no natural antithesis between something feeling like it's your own and the ways in which trauma has informed it. The antithesis becomes weaponized only when it comes to non-normative identities, which is why it's important to begin to think about trauma differently overall, which is one of the arguments that we're making in this book. The clinical case that we discuss shows how um, the inter generational factors that may contribute to a child's trauma have both shaped um, their gender, but also have changed it, shaped their, uh, their sturdiness when it comes to their gender and their, their need to be themselves, not in the sense of like they were always this way, but in the sense that this is who they have translated themselves to be. And the analyst's job is not to question that, but to help the patient defend it. One of the things we're arguing is that you know, gender is about goodness of fit. And that goodness of fit, what the ways in which one comes to inhabit a category and, you know, look, the names precede us. We don't get to opt out of gender. So in that sense, all gender is non-consensual. All There's something of trauma in this, in all gender in that we are, we're called into being through it, right? What we do after that does offer possibilities for agency. Um, does the category that we were named into, is that something that can be habitable as a site of flourishing? You know, it may or may not be. It may be at some points in your life and not at others. Um, are there other gendered formations that offer more oxygen, offer more capacity? Perhaps, right? And 
But so if you think about gender as goodness of fit, in that sense, there's no such thing as a true gender, at least not a, as a totality. It's, my, it's true enough, good enough at that moment. And this also, I mean, I think the model we're offering, um, which again, I want to emphasize, it's not about disqualifying anyone's self-accounting in which they really feel that the, their gender they identify with is, is it's been with them all along. It feels immutable. It feels, this is the language we have available as part of our cultural mythology of what it means for something to have been there all along. You might indeed feel born that way. We're not discrediting, disqualifying any of that language. There needs to be room for that. But there are many queer and trans people who, for example, would not say of their gender, of their sexuality, they've always felt this. They wouldn't say of it that it feels core. They would want to have the, be able to have the space to narrate their own transitions and changes and even self-doubts, right? Without that being slammed down because somehow they're like, what, breaking faith, telling the story they're not supposed to tell, right? That complexity is already there in the stories we tell amongst ourselves. So, you know, when we were making, when we were really, we really wrestled with, you know, whether to make some of the arguments we're making about the relationship between gender and trauma. We don't want it weaponized against queer and trans people as members of the queer community ourselves, um, you know, um, this really matters to us, but we also realize that what a fantasy that a writer, as writers to think that any argument we make, we could fully control where it goes.